across all night long. It, it, it is a miracle, really, and we're really out of control of that. One of the reasons I like to go out to the desert is because I want to get away from it all. I don't want any responsibility. And God has given me that opportunity when I go to the desert. I'd like to tell you about Miracles on the Street and Full Gospel Businessmen. Everyday life is full of miracles and Full Gospel Businessmen and Miracles on the Street are ordinary men and women who have experienced miracles. The best miracle we can experience is knowing God. Knowing the God of this vast sky that's in the desert that we have no control over. Miracles happen when we give control to God. When we give control of our lives to God. When we simply pray, Lord Jesus, I give you control of my life. What we do is we provide real live people, people who have actually experienced the love of God through their testimonies, through their stories, and their lives have been made better. And we are here to encourage you to give your life to Jesus. I, uh, search you. Hello, my name is Oscar. I, uh, I've been here before. Yep. A few yep. Times. <coughs> I usually go to Harry's uh, meeting down in, uh, in Anaheim. I live on the other side of Moreno Valley. It's always a good drive. <laughs> God always has the road wide open for me. And Hallelujah. Always free of uh, any problems. Anyways, uh, I'm uh, having a little surgery in uh, the 20th, which is two weeks from yesterday. And uh, that's going to be uh, on my right shoulder. Uh, they're going to most likely do a uh, rotator cuff repair. I mean, God's taking care of it, so uh, it's, it's all going to be good. Just like last year, I had back surgery. Harry called me when I was in the hospital, and uh, just before I went into the surgery room, he uh, prayed over me, and I prayed, and uh, I knew God was going to guide the hands of the doctors. And, and when I came out of it, the first thing I did, as soon as I came out of my anesthesia, I just started praising God, and, you know, uh, people talk bad things about uh, back surgeries and I'm sure it's not the same for everybody but the doctor said you know he says the numbness in your legs is going to go away that I, I can tell you it's going to take some time the lower back pain I don't know I didn't give you a new back so you know it was almost since to me the pain on my lower back was gone after 17, 18 years of pain. Wow. And I know that God had helped me through it, you know, he managed my pain and all that. But uh, anyways, uh, that's that's where I am right now. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm a happy man. Regardless of the situation, I get up in the morning and say, first thing I do is I praise God and I thank Him for letting me breathe one more day and another day that I can praise Him. Thank you. Amen. There's your intro. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, first of all, like you said, uh, my name is Chris. Uh, 
I'm gonna make this uh, you know kind of brief, but I'm gonna squeeze a lot into it. So pay attention. Uh, <laughs> 1979, on my 17th birthday, I was uh, handed by the judge 17 years in California State Prison. Uh, there, were, it, at that time, I did 11 years, nine months on it. I spent the next 33, or and from then the next 33 years in and out of prison. Spent almost 20 years of my adult life behind prison bars. Uh, never being able to let go of my past, always thinking that my, or letting my past dictate what my future is going to be because I couldn't let go of my past. Not that other people couldn't. Of course, parole, they won't let you go until you're done. You know, but my, it was a personal issue with me thinking, you know, uh, I'm not going to give this prison number back because it's the only thing that they can't take from me if I don't let them have it. Uh, and then, it, you know, it came, to, it came to realize that, you know what, they didn't take nothing from me. I gave it up. Okay, it's my actions, you know, what were, uh, it, it was my actions that were causing all the turmoil in my life. Uh, in 2008, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, hepatitis C. Uh, due to my lifestyle at the time, uh, I didn't do anything about it and continued just doing, you know, bad things. Two years ago in June, this past June, uh, me and a friend of mine were driving down the street, and we found this, saw this little church. We pulled into this church. And, you know, let's just go inside, see what's going on. So we did, and I'm looking at the pastor, going, "Dang, he looks really familiar." And so, uh, you know, being the first time in that church, still in active heroin addiction, uh, I really didn't talk to anybody there. I just went in to see what the church was like. Well, me and my friend talked about it all week long. The next following week, we went back in. I picked up a program, and I looked at the pastor's name, Pastor Richard Marquetto. I've known this man for 35 years. And uh, so me and Shanna, we, we started going to this church. It's the church that, that Ken's with now. And uh, in June of, or two years ago, like I said, active heroin addiction, going to church loaded because I wasn't going to go sick. You know, uh, they prayed for me and, uh, to relieve the addiction. Anybody that knows, anybody that's done heroin, when you try to kick that, violently ill. I never got sick. I never once had the craving to use it again. And since June, two years ago, still heroin for you. Uh, beginning of 2011, I was uh, trying to get my hep C issues taken care of. Uh, they were having problems with, with the lab work, the blood work and stuff that kept coming up. Well, they came up with, uh, with all the blood I was given, I kept telling the doctor, you know, if you find something, you better name it after me with all the blood I've given you. You know, maybe, you know <laughs> there better be my name in this somewhere. You know? uh, which, that, that wasn't any luck. But they, uh, they finally found out that uh, I was diagnosed with uh, a rare form of leukemia, which is called cytomegalovirus. Uh, it's not a cancer cell. It attacks the blood proteins the same as hepatitis does. Well... Now I'm trying to get take two things taken care of and trying to get off parole. Well, I finally got off parole April 13th of this year. I'm no longer on parole. They don't own my own me anymore. I am Christopher Nila, not you know C11743. Okay, I'm me. Uh, so uh, I'm running in and out of doctors trying to get both of them taken care of. And so I did some lab work just recently, and the doctor calls me and says, "Look, we need to have more lab work done." Because there's something going on that we don't understand. Okay, well, I went in yesterday to get the results. Uh, my viral loads went from 1 million to 79 million in four years. Okay, which is bad. Okay, they, uh, they're talking chemo and, and you know, both Seprevir and Teleprevir. So it's like an interferon and a chemo that they're going to use to knock this out. But there's absolutely zero sign of the leukemia. They can't find it anywhere. They've taken, yeah. believe me, they've taken their blood. Uh, so, but now uh, all tests have indicated that uh, there's a sign of a tumor somewhere. So I have to go in Monday morning, get more blood, more blood. Uh, the funny thing is, they can find veins that I haven't been able to find. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know, thanks, God. <laughs> You know, it, but it's all good. So, you know, I have to go get blood Monday morning. And uh, on uh, August 3rd, I have uh, a date with an oncologist. So, I mean, things are looking good. And, you know, I have people all the time that ask me, dude, you have two diseases that are trying to take you out. 
And you walk around here smiling and laughing and caring. And I tell them, you know what? Check this out. You can't live in fear and faith at the same time. Amen. You just simply can't do it. No. You know, either, you know, every morning I wake up and I turn my will and my life over to God. Amen. By 9 o'clock, I take it back. <laughs> okay, I I can do a better job. Okay? You know, because that's, 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 that's this going to work right here, not this. Okay, so, you know, and the good thing I like, that, you know, is my God allows me to have a bad moment, but he does not allow me to have a bad day. You know, and I can, I can go to him at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, in prayer and start my day over. And I don't know how many, you know, how many people are, you know, have that, but you know what? I am so thankful that I do. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, I can walk around and make, you know, in, in fear with uh, the things that are going on in my life and make everybody around me miserable, make everybody just as scared as I used to be, and, and just, you know, an absolute wreck. But it's still going to be what it is. Yeah. Or I can walk in faith, trust that, you know, okay, so God took care of the leukemia one, okay? He took care of the one that the doctors maybe couldn't. You know what I mean? So the doctors can take care of the, the hepatitis, so he's letting them do that. Okay, well, that's the way I'm looking at it. I don't have obstacles in my life anymore. I have opportunities. Amen. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, right, and I struggle uh, weekly because I have so much to do. I can't go out and work because it wouldn't be fair to an employer uh, to go out and get a job, you know, because I'm a commercial driver and a heavy equipment operator. You know, and they, when they need you, they need, you know, you're, you need to be there every day. And I can't, I, it wouldn't be fair to go to out and, and try to get work and then have to take so many days off. You know, it's just, it just wouldn't be fair. And, you know, so, you know, thank God that uh, my ex-sister-in-law has put me up with her family. You know, but uh, there, you know, if anybody does, you know, and I have to put this out there because closed mouth doesn't get fed. Mm -hmm. If anybody has any type of, you know, part-time work, yard work, anything like that, please get at me uh, so I can give you my phone number. All I ask is a day's advance notice so that I can get to where I need to go uh, because I do need to make, you know, to help bring something into the house. You know, I've been there for almost three months and, you know, they're basically taking care of me and I'm not used to that. So if I can bring something to the house, that would, that would be great. And uh, the only other thing, uh, you know, I, want, oh, I wanted to share something. Suggestive reading, okay? Power, power of a positive attitude, believe you can. Amen. I've gone through this book several, several times. Every time I read it, I find something new. And this, I just want to share something with you guys real quick. It says, your future contains more happiness than any past you can remember. Don't look at your past to determine your future. You can't walk backwards into the future. True misery can be found by being a yesterday person trying to get along in a tomorrow world. Don't let your past mistakes become memorials. They should be cremated, not embalmed. <laughs> Those who predominantly talk about the past are going backwards. Those who talk about the present are usually just maintaining. But those who talk about the future are growing. Though the more you look backwards, the less you'll see what's ahead of you. Some people stay so far in the past that the future is gone before they get there. The future frightens only those who prefer living in the past. No one has ever backed into prosperity. You can't have a better tomorrow if you are thinking about yesterday today. Yesterday has passed forever and is beyond our control. What lies behind is insignificant compared to what lies ahead. You know, and I didn't start growing until I let go of my past and let it stop dictating yeah. what my future was going to be because I had no future. Amen. You know, and uh, two things before I go, always remember, you know, uh, regret looks back, worry looks around, loss looks down, growth looks up. You know, where, where do you look? You know, where's your vision? And the last thing is, you know, don't fry bacon naked. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't fry bacon in the nude. That's just a little advice. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Gail, and uh, last December we had a lady come as our guest speaker. Her name was was Sally, and uh, she was telling how, and she's she's not only a, a, a natural Jew, but she's a born again Jew, and uh, God has called her to go back to Germany and Poland to make ends between the Jewish people and the Germans and the Polish, the ones that, that massacred the Jews. And uh, so while she was telling about how she's 
God called her to go back there, and she was telling us that she was planning on going this year. The Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to go with her. So I went up and told her after the meeting was over with that God had told me that he wanted me to go with her this year. And she says, well, she says, I've had other people tell me the same thing. But she says, I'll pray about it and see what the Lord would say. Well, then she came to our Monday night meeting in December, and she said that God had told her that I was supposed to go with her. So we went on the 4th of June. We were there two weeks. And uh, in the two weeks that we were there, we <coughs> did 4,000 roses <clears throat> and uh, our theme is a tournament of roses and we stripped off the bottom leaves and the thorns so you could hang on to without getting poked and uh, then we went out and passed them out well we had tied a card to the roses explaining what the roses was, was symbolizing and it was uh, the blood that was shed you know of the people and the blood of Jesus that was shed for us and for his love that he had for us. And a lot of the people, as they would read this card, they just melted down, a lot of them started weeping, and, and uh, you could just see the continent change because they were kind of a little bit leery of even taking the rose. We were handing them out free, and a lot of people knew how expensive they were. And they couldn't imagine that we was giving them these high quality roses free. And they wanted to buy them. And we, no, no, they're free. And uh, then when they read the card and they saw what we were doing, they just melted down and fear was gone. And you could just see the continents raise up. They hugged us, they kissed us, they shook our hands. And... Uh, and we also had concerts. We had four different concerts. And, and boy, they just lit up when we told them that, that uh, we were having a concert. And uh, they showed up, a lot of them showed up. We had somewhere between 50 and 100 salvations. And uh, we actually led some to the Lord right on the spot when we ministered to them on the streets. And, uh, oh my gosh. So, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it was just awesome, and uh, but, but it was it was a working vacation because we worked till ten ten thirty a lot of nights, uh, <clears throat> stemming the roses and getting them ready for the next day. And then we went out and passed them out, and uh, it, it, we just had awesome results and. It was just a blessing to see the Lord work amongst the people over there. And uh, we know that we were just more or less opening up the door, and we know that God is going to continue working in the lives of these people over there. And, it, and we just, well, like, when we went, we were it was about a 15-hour flight, plus about three hours, you know, in between time, so... So it was about almost 20 hours. I had about an hour nap on a plane. When we got there, we went directly to where we were going to stay, put put our bags in there, and went directly to work. And uh, like I say, I'd had about an hour nap in 20 hours. And we went right to work. No jet lag, no nothing. Wasn't tired, wasn't sleepy or anything. And we worked to about 7 o'clock that night, and then they fed us dinner there, and then we went back to where we were staying. And God just blessed us all the way through. And one reason God had called me to go was to keep our morale up. And the Lord just used me. I just kept him in stitches all the time. I just <laughs> said funny things and did strange things. And I just kept laughing all the time. And it just kept our morale up so, so that God could work in us. You can't, God can't bless us if there's division or, or you know, we're not all in unity and harmony. Mm -hmm. and, and it was just awesome to see how God worked it all out. And, and the results were just tremendous. Yeah. I'm going to start with Dave. You all know his, his music. 
but uh, maybe Dave could tell us a little bit about maybe a, a brief introduction of yourself. Okay. Uh, make it quick here. Uh, grew up in the suburbs of LA, but I've been in the Inland Empire for about 15 years now. I love it out here. Um, and, uh, active, just helping out the local churches in the area, a whole bunch of different ones. Uh, whenever the worship team is on retreat or somewhere, by myself, you know, do a few songs of worship songs. But that's that's my ministry. I work a regular job like everybody else, mm -hmm. and I love to play while people are eating. So whenever you have one of these things, you want some background music, you got me. Uh, that's my ministry. My uh, surgery. Oh. Here's the scenario. You hear the siren. takes place in heaven. There has been a robbery. Angels are dispatched. The reply comes back. We caught him and taken him to the Lord. The Lord says, you've done a twofold robbery. You ask, wherein have I robbed you? The Lord replies, for more about this exciting book, please go to furygiftbaskets.com or Amazon. Jesus and give my life to him and still hate religion. Why would I turn my back on the methodical religions and still seek to be the relationship with the king of all kings? Why are so many hurting and feeling empty inside even after their weekly so-called church service? Think about it. How can the man-made rituals with all the many formulas, doctrines, regulations, and any other items such as stained glass, collection plates, highly designed pews, and the elevated platform for some highly educated preacher change a single life? But one man hung on the cross 2,000 years ago can the crap that's been flowing from these pool pits and these things called church with their self-centered man-made idols have brainwashed many into believing that theirs is the only path to follow. It certainly is not. There are many programs such as Vacation Bible School, Holiday Place, Covered Dish Dinners, Bazaars, and maybe throw in a car wash are all designed to bring in more people, which will bring in more of that coveted money. As long as man places his carnal mind and hand in his desire for notoriety and power and continues with his laws of judgment, rules, and regulations with the failures of those that have preceded him, this thing called church will continue to fall. It has to. When Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, he wasn't talking about Peter, but the revelation that was given to him by the Holy Spirit. The church is a people. A gathering of two or three, with Jesus the Christ of God in the midst of those seeking his way, truth, and life. This is a far cry from these things that look more like a whorehouse, tempting their wares with their painted up faces, trying to get as many would be to enter their doors and empty their pockets. God is the God of love, mercy, and grace, not that the man's that flesh man is placed on his underlings. I wrote a 252 page book called The Two Trees Within. I'm glad to send you a free copy, or you can download it at www.themanwithin1.com.